Luke chapter 17. And we didn't finish it, but uh, what we will do, we will uh, kind of do a quick review. And we kind of picked, we left off on uh, verse 20. So we'll, uh, uh, we'll go through the reading again and uh, do a quick review of what we've already studied and pick back up on it uh, starting again in, in verse 20. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and let's get our reading in. Chapter 17. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he is come from the field, Go and sit down to meat, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, must have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, shew yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, or see there. Go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things, and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, 
Wheresoever the body is, thither will the egos be gathered together. All right. That is chapter 17. And um, as we had stated before, um, you know, we went through this on last week, part, part of it. And uh, we're looking now to uh, hopefully complete this, uh, this chapter. But just to do a quick, quick review. Um, first of all. Hey, I'm Gay's wife. Hi. What's the name? Mary. Mary. How you doing, Mary? Fine. Glad to have you here. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we're just doing a, 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 a verse by verse uh, study of chapter 17. We're going through the entire Bible, little uh, uh, one chapter at a time, and uh, we're making progress. We're getting there. And so we're in chapter 17 of Luke now. Exactly. All right, so let's take a look here. Uh, once again, just as a quick review. Remember, Jesus is, is, is at a situation where he is talking to a group of folk. Um, there, was a, there was a gathering there. We had disciples. We also had who? Pharisees and Sadducees. So you have to get this, the the setting in your mind as to where he is, all right? He's just not, uh, he's not in the synagogue. He's not just walking down the street at this particular point. He's sitting in the house of a Pharisee that invited him. And I say in a house, it could be in their courtyard and so forth. And they're mingling and there are, there are questions and, 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 uh, and comments that are being made. And so uh, in verse, in chapter 17, we picked it back up. It says, and just to review it, we saw in the first verse, it says, and then he said unto his disciples, this is Jesus, he said, it is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. Now, we talked about this on last week. And that is that because we live in what kind of a world? Sinful. We live in a sinful world. It's impossible to live in this world and not be affected by sin. You're going to have something that is going to break your heart, get you upset, get you di uh, discouraged, get you mad, get you, you know, all kinds of bent up because we are in a sinful world. And Jesus said, it's impossible to go through this world and not have offenses come. Now, he, he's now going to then kind of specify how offenses come. Some come deliberately because people just don't like you for being a God-loving, God-fearing person. And so Jesus says about that, he says, um, he says, but woe unto, unto them by whom they come, for it would be better for, for them that a millstone be hanged about their neck and cast into the sea. All right? So now then they should uh, offend one of these little ones. And these little ones, not just talking about little children, but he's talking about those that follow him. So uh, you really don't want to be de a deliberate offender. Uh, and we talked uh, uh, pretty much in depth on that, and just to kind of overview it, uh, there is no one that's going to get by. This is basically what Jesus is saying. We read in the news, we see on TV all these people that do these, these child molestings and these kidnappings and all this various stuff, and we see that sometimes it looks like, well, maybe they didn't get justice, or well, what about this person that was found innocent and we know he did something? Remember this, nobody gets by. We may get by in our system, we may get through and, and, and uh, unscathed and not have justice in our system, man's system. But God has all records. He knows all that's going to happen. And there is not one person that will not have to deal with their situation. Now, the thing that you have to realize is, is since that is the case, why don't I then deal with mines now? And so how do we do that? We do that by what? Giving our, 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 our heart and our soul and our mind to who? To the Lord Jesus. And we take on whose righteousness? The Lord's righteousness. And therefore, when I stand before God, I, I stand and say, Lord, I traded in my righteousness for the righteousness that Christ has. So therefore, I don't have to suffer the penalty of sin. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is what? But the gift that God gives us, the gift of eternal, the, the gift of God is what? Eternal life. So therefore, we don't have to worry about that. But those who don't accept Jesus, it's going to be bad. 
But then he went on, all right? And he talked about, in verse 3, he said, but he said, take heed of yourself. If thy brother tras trespass against you. Now, wait a minute. Now, before he was talking about those that, that just uh, are evildoers and just do wrong for wrong's sake. Are you trying to tell me now by what Jesus is saying here that those that love the Lord Jesus can also trespass against you? Wait a minute, just because you go and you study the Bible, that don't make you a, just a perfect person? No. So you're still going to have situations. You're still going to have issues. And this is what Jesus was pointing out. And we talked about that on last week in depth. So just to kind of uh, uh, give that as a, um, an overview, Jesus gave us a, 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 a view as how to handle it. He said what? When your brother trespasses against you, you go to him and you do what? Rebuke him. Now remember, rebuke does not mean putting your finger in his face and swagging it around and, you know, and, and telling them off and so forth. Rebuke means pointing out to somebody that they've done wrong. Now, uh, there are times you have to be a little bit more enthusiastic. And other times you can be quiet. But sometimes the situation will dictate as to how you will handle it. But you do need to go to the person and let them know. You know, you did something that, that uh, you, you need to give me an apology for you. Now, the, the Bible says that if your brother does what? Repents, what are you supposed to do? All right. But then he turns right back around the next day and does the same thing. But then he comes back and says, I'm sorry. What are you going to do? <laughs> but he comes back, you know, he, did, he did it Monday and Tuesday. Now he comes Wednesday, he, here he is again. <laughs> but now, what, what, now this, is this a brother? What does Jesus say? If he comes to say, I'm sorry, what are you supposed to do? Forgive, forgive. forgive him. But now, what, one thing that you have to keep in mind, and this is where you have to understand what the Lord is saying. You don't stand there and let a person keep smacking you, and they say, I'm, I'm sorry, all right, I forgive you. Then you stand there and let them smack you again. You, you use what? Wisdom. wisdom. You use wisdom. You use common sense. But you realize that there are situations where some people got, got issues. Some of it is demons. Some of it is mental. Some of it is just, uh, you know, uh, just, just pent up situations where they, they are going through a bad time in their life. There's a whole lot of reasons. But the thing to keep in mind, what did Jesus say in the beginning of this chapter? It is impossible for offenses not to come. They're going to happen. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard anybody else, is tr anybody else try, you and everybody else is going to do things that God is going to label as incorrect behavior. Didn't you compare it to when uh, John the Baptist was in jail and he was like to Jesus, you know, what's up, you know? And Jesus was like, don't be offended, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Even John the Baptist sat in jail and he was like, you know, he knew Jesus was the, was the, the Messiah. But as things did not go the way he what thought they should go, he began to question even what Jesus was. And Jesus sent back to his disciples. He didn't really tell them yes or no. He just said, John, you go back uh, uh, to his disciples. You go back and tell John what things you see. Now, John was to do what? Compare what he saw, what was told to him, according to what he knew scripture was and what was being properly fulfilled. All right, so we talked about that once again and in depth. And then we went on, and in chapter 5, we saw that, and, the, and uh, after hearing all of this, one of the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Now, why would, you want, why would he want his faith increased? Because he realized, that you, Lord, you just told me to do something that I find very difficult. You told me to forgive people for doing stuff to me, you know, if they do it to me day after day after day after day, which I find very hard to do. So therefore, Lord, I need you to help me. I need you to increase my faith because I don't know if I can do that. And I thought that was a very good request of the apostles because I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know that I can do that either. And so if, if I run into a situation where somebody is doing that to me and this person is a brother and they're confessing Christ, I'm going to need the spirit of God to, to help me because my own personal situation is going to be, you know, brother, there's something wrong with you. You know, and so, Lord, you got to increase my faith to help me to adhere. Remember when Jesus was being nailed to the cross? And they were lying and 
and, 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 and he went through a bad trial and they had already spit in his face and smacked him and you know, pulled his beard and put a thorn of, of a, a crown on his head. And what did Jesus say as he was being lifted up on that cross? Father, what? Forgive them. See, he did exactly what he told his apostles to do here. He said, Father, forgive them. And so when the apostles heard this, they had a reaction like we did. We were like, I don't know, I didn't do that. So what did they do? They asked Jesus, Lord, you're going to have to increase my faith. So how, what did Jesus do? Did Jesus say, whim, zam, you know, boo, bam, more faith go to you? No, he didn't cast no spell or no, nothing on them. He gave them, some, he said, listen, he gave them an example. He says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, now, we always have to keep that in mind because a lot of times we think what that means is that if our faith is as small as a grain of mustard seed, and that may not be, how y'all doing, as, um, as accurate as just looking at it as a grain of mustard seed, Luke chapter 17. And the thing you have to keep in mind, a grain of mustard seed when, it, when you look at it, it's extremely tiny. We talked about this on last week and how small it is and how uh, uh, when you compare it to just a grain of dirt, you know, how, um, uh, how tiny it is to, uh, uh, you know, to granules of, of, uh, of, of dirt. But when you plant it, you do what? You put it under the dirt. And somehow or another, that little piece of uh, uh, a seed takes what's in the ground and uses the grounds, nitrogen and all these other chemical compounds to build itself up and lift itself through the ground. Yes, sir. In, in Romans, even Paul says, we can explain earthly things, and we can explain things that are not seen by the things that are made. Exactly. So like you said, the things that are made, like the plants growing, that explains the spiritual things like Christ rising. Yep. So it's kind of now, in our day, we can even give you another example. You ever go down and, um, you know, in, in one of these uh, mall complexes where you, all this concrete and tar is just laid everywhere, right? And sometimes you'll just be walking, and through the cement and tar and concrete, you see this weed coming through the ground. A little cracking. Now, wait a minute. How did this little weed, which you could grab and snap, but you can't grab and snap that concrete, how did that weed get through the concrete? Through just doing its natural processes and continuing to do its natural processes, somehow or another, it manages to get a little crack. It finds the narrowest little ways and it just finds where it's weak at it. And somehow, at some point, and someday, it cracks through the concrete. That's the grain of mustard seed. You do what normally people would not expect you to be able to do, but you're only doing what comes natural to you. You're doing your gift. When you find and discover the gift of God in you, there is nothing that can stop it. Nothing. But you have to get into the Word to let God and get to know God so good that God can get you to know yourself. Because you think you know you. You only know about you. God knows you. He has the owner's manual. He knows everything you can do. Things that you don't even realize you can do. But God knows I put that in you. And if you have the grain of mustard seed, you could do things impossible. Like what he just said. He says, look what he says. In verse 6. And the Lord said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say to this sycamore tree, be thy plucked up by the what? Root. You know how hard it is to pull a tree up by the root? <laughs> by the root and be thy uh, planted into the sea and it should what? Obey you. So basically it's saying whatever your gift is, there is nothing that can stop it. But you, just have, you have to have faith in what? In God. Now, Make no mistake, some people like to preach and teach people to have faith in faith, have, have understand faith, and have confidence in the faith that you have. And faith then becomes their power or their tool. 
Faith is just a means in which God uses to allow things to do what it's designed to do. There is no unique, isolated power in faith. The power is in who? It's in God. Don't let people get you confused. Right? People tell you you need to have God kind of faith. No, you need to have faith in God. It's not the God kind of faith. You just have to have faith in God. And then God will then begin to show you what you can uh, can do. Now keep this in mind. Ain't no need you going up to my, well, I'm going to have so much faith. I'm just going to believe God. I'm going down into that Mercedes Benz deal. And I'm going to write me a check and pray on that check. And I'm just going to, you're going to jail. You're going to jail. All right. Faith in what God has given what? You. But how do you discover that? Having that relationship with the Lord. You have to build that. And once you build it, you'll be surprised. He will let you, see, he will let you discover it. But you, you're not going to discover it just kind of, you know, haphazardly. You have to want it, earnestly seek. That's why we say pray. Seek God through his word. And then, I don't know how it works, but somehow or another, through the spirit, God will speak to you. I can't explain it. It's going to be different for everybody. But I tell you this, if you do it and stay consistent with it, God will show you you. And then you'll find that peace and that joy in doing that which God has called you to do that uh, uh, nothing else in this world will give you. Nothing else. All right. And so we went on and we talked about uh, 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 faith and, and we're still doing um, the basic review. But uh, let's skip down to verse 10. I want to just highlight this. It says, so likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, we are what? Unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Now, what Jesus was talking about, once again, and the story above that, which we won't go through the whole thing. Once again, we're just reviewing this from last week. Uh, when the servant comes in out of the field, and the servant has uh, 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 his master sitting there, the servant gets up and he serves the, the master his, his meal, and um, the master doesn't ask the servant, would you, put, would you like for me to serve you? You sit down and I'll bring you your meal. The servant knows his job and he goes and does what? Serves the master. So Jesus is saying there are particular uh, 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 stations and duties that have to happen in everything, in every phase of life, including within faith and within obedience and within learning and within development. The student can't teach the teacher, but that don't mean a teacher can't become a, uh, that a student can't become a teacher. You follow me? So you learn those stages. When you go out to, uh, to the Olive Garden, you don't, sit, you don't go in there and then tell the waitress, what would you like to have to drink? You tell the waitress what you want to drink, right? It's just proper organization of things. And Jesus is saying that when you, and when you are relating to me, understand that those organization and those stages and those things that build upon other things are necessary. So, therefore, you are not going to just wake up and understand everything there is about uh, your calling and your ministry and your, when you have done nothing to what? Build upon. You have to do what? Start. And then when you've done it and you begin to learn one or two things, what does he say? Don't think that you've done anything great. You've only done what? What you were supposed to do. I heard one comedian one time, he said, um, he said he get upset when, when, when guys talk about, I take care of my children. He said, well, I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, what you want, a cookie? <laughs> you're supposed to take care of you. You, you, know, you don't walk around bragging, talking about, I take care of my children. I take care. That's what you're supposed to do. There's no big deal in that. You know, somebody, well, I, I put oil in my car. <laughs> what we do? <laughs> you're supposed to put oil in your car. You know, if you got something extra, then that's something to, be, to talk about. But what God is saying, when you're doing your um, proper uh, uh, duty, you're supposed to just recognize I'm only doing what I'm supposed to do. So when you discover and be able to do what he's saying here is when you do get to the point to where you're able to break through and do certain things and you find out that you have gifts and, and things. Don't think yourself as anything wonderful. And that's one of the problems we have today. People begin, they, they get a gift, and all of a sudden, you know, don't just call me Wayne. Uh, you have to call me uh, Reverend Pastor Wayne. 
K. Uh, call me, and then if I happen to have, uh, we, we do another little house ministry. I got, now I got two house ministries. Now you have to call me Reverend Pastor Bishop Wayne, you know, because I'm all that, all right? All right, now, understand, I'm not knocking whatever anybody else is doing there. You know, I, and, and somebody wants, them, wants me to call them bishop, you know what I call them? I call them whatever they want me to call them. And I don't try to belittle them, but I'm just going by what the word says. The word says that we, we should not call people these names because we have but one father. All right? And so therefore, there's only one master. And in Jesus, even when we get into the next chapter, we're going to see somebody's going to walk up to Jesus to call him good master. And Jesus says, why are you calling me good master? There's only one good, and that's God. Now, either you, you, you calling me God, and if I ain't God, there's no reason for you to call me good master. But in the reality, he was the only one that ever walked on this earth that deserved the title good master. All right? So let's keep that in mind. Uh, and I, I don't, like I said, I don't say that to belittle anybody else's stuff. I just say that so that we know what the, what the scripture says. But we still should show respect. The Bible says give honor to whom, who, what? Honor is due. So, if, you know, if you got nine churches and you want to be called a bishop, then, you know, fine. I don't have a problem with that. But I find that the, it, it, it goes against what Jesus says here. But then, uh, as we continue our review and we're getting down to where we left off at, um, we see that Jesus, um, in verse 11, he now leaves his setting. Remember, he was at a place in a courtyard or in a, in a, in a, in a living area of these Pharisees, and they were there, his apostles and disciples and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. All these people had gathered around, and all these questions were being asked. But now in verse 11, it says, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem. Now he's on his way to Jerusalem. Why is he going to Jerusalem? He's going to be crucified. All right, we're at that point. So he's heading now towards the city. It says, Then he passed through the midst of Samaria and through Galilee, and he came to a certain village. So now he's at a village we don't really know the name of because it says certain village. But we know he's going to Jerusalem. He passed through Samaria and he passed through Galilee. And now he's at this certain village. And he met these, what, ten lepers. All right? And, uh, and they lifted up their voices and they cried unto him. And, uh, uh, and they, they asked him to have mercy on him. And in verse 14 it says, And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were what? Cleansed. All right? And then we made this comparison. We said, read, look at this again. It says, and he said unto them. All right? And we go back up to verse 6. Look at what verse 6 says. And the Lord said, if you have faith of a grain of mustard seed, you may what? Say unto the sycamore tree. Right? So he's giving them an example uh, of, of what you can do when you truly know who you are. He said, you could just say to that sycamore tree, be you what? Plucked up by the root. Then we come all the way back down here to verse 14, and look what happens. He's now exhibiting what he just told them they could do if they truly knew what the gift of God was in them. Now, that don't mean that you can say to a leper, go be the hill, but whatever the gift is, all you got to do is say it act upon it and the gift that you have will operate just like that no matter how impossible it may seem to man all right and so you may have you may have a job that nobody there's no way in the world god uh that, that mean that, that man would believe you could have that job but god said you could have it you ain't got the degree you ain't got the background but somehow or another god worked your mind so you can still have that job you may be able to do a, you know a myriad of examples of, of things that god will give you to do you may have the understanding of how to how to uh, raise money and finances, but you've never been to you know uh, to, uh, to accounting school or whatever the case may be. There may be the ability to encourage people, but you're not a, a, a psychoanalyst and you don't have a degree in in social work. But somehow or another, you could just talk to people and they just seem to feel better in the midst of difficulties. Whatever your gift is, God will allow you to just do it. Jesus now just right here. He gave them an example in verse 14 of what he was talking about in verse 6. He said to the lepers, go be, your, be thou healed. And the Bible says, as they went, they were healed. And then we, we saw that what happened. 
they went and they found they were healed. But how many came back to give him thanks? One. Only one. And then Jesus talked to that one and said, where are the nine? And then Jesus said in verse 19, he said unto him, arise and go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee what? Whole. Not just whole, not just cleansed from the leprosy, but what? Whole and true relationship with who Jesus is. The Lord is merciful to us all. I mean, he gives us all breaks. The sinner and the saint. We all, I mean, this is a beautiful day, right? <laughs> Wouldn't it be just very odd if this beautiful day, only those that know the Lord as Savior, the sun was shining, and then everybody else that didn't know the Lord, it was just pouring down, thunderstorm raining on top of them? That'd be kind of odd, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But God is good. When, he, when a good day comes, guess what happens? Everybody enjoys the good day, right? right. God is merciful. Judgment reigns on the righteous and unrighteous also. Exactly, exactly. So uh, he's merciful. I mean, he hasn't called us into judgment today. There's some people walking around today that don't know Jesus as their Savior. Mm -hmm. And they need to continually thank God that, that, that God doesn't call us in right now because they're not ready. There are a lot of people that are not ready to die. They're not ready to meet their maker. And God's given them what? Mercy. He's given them grace. He's given them time to get themsel themselves together. God is just that merciful. All right? But that will not always be. There will come a time when it ends. All right. So now, picking back up from where we left off at, verse 20, it says, and uh, when he... Uh, was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with what? Observation. All right. Verse 21, neither shall they say lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, what is Jesus saying? He's saying that your understanding of the kingdom of God is not how you think it, it is. The kingdom of God is not going to come like a cloud coming in this, over the sky. You could just look and say, oh, look at that cloud. You know, that's the kingdom of God. That, look at that building that's coming. That's the, that's the kingdom of God. Or, or look at, you know, or look on the calendar and see, well, the kingdom of God is coming, you know, on that day. It's not like that. The kingdom of God is a spiritual entity. And so, therefore, the spirit of God, the, king, the kingdom of God, Number one, always exists. It always exists. But it exists uh, um, around us, in us. It has never stopped existing, and it never will stop existing. Our problem is that we are blind to it. And we are not prepared, really, to enter into it, which is why we're blind to it. So it never stops existing. It never, it's never going to just just kick off and start it's already here but now are you going to prepare your heart mind and soul to be prepared to number one be able to observe it and when the blinders are taken off because remember Paul talked about how we are in this natural realm when it comes to understanding the true reality and the true reality is not the natural not the matter that we see but the spiritual he says that we see the spirit realm as though we're looking through what? A glass darkly. So basically we don't see it all. We don't see it clearly. And he tells us that the spiritual world is, is, um, is, is we, we are blinded to a lot of that. And so we don't see it. We also see an example in, in the book of Kings where Elijah, Elisha is talking to his servant. And his servant looks out the window because they've had this this is a situation with the uh, the uh, the Syrian government, and he sees the Syrian government. He sees the warriors surrounding Elijah's residence, and he goes, "My goodness, look at these troops!" And Elijah, Elisha is just like, you know, don't worry. But he says, "Look at look, you know, you know, just bring it into normal normal uh, surroundings." He says, "Look out the kitchen window, man! Don't you see them people out there?" And Elisha says, those that are with us are more than those that are with them. And so the, the servant couldn't see it. And so Elisha prays to God. God opened up his eyes 
so that he might see. And then when he goes and looks again, not only does he see the Syrian army, but now he sees myriad, in other words, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of angelic hosts surrounding the enemy. And that's what we don't see. See, the kingdom of God is right here. It's right here in, this, in the muddy cup, right in here. There are, are, are things that are going on that we just do not see. We don't see the angels that are here. We don't see the battles that are fighting right now. The struggle that's going on for, um, you know, the, the, the enemy is trying to find reasons for us, for, for each and every one of us to not want to pay attention to what this word is saying. And the angels are doing what they do to help build us and encourage us and cheer us on. We don't see none of that. All right? But when, when, the, when the, the blinders are taken off, guess what's going to happen? It's not going to be, it came. It's just, you're going to be like, oh, it was already here. It was already in our midst. It is here with us. All right? And so Jesus is saying, understand that. The kingdom of God is not going to be the new kid on the block. <laughs> the kingdom of God is here. That's the foundation of reality. The natural world is the world that's going to be a dissolve. The Bible says what? Heaven and earth shall what? Pass away. But my word will stand forever. All right. So this word will, will be forever with us. So Jesus is trying to get them to understand that. You know, don't think that what you got is all that and then something new is going to come to replace that. What you got is temporal. This natural realm is very, very temporal. All right. Verse 22. And he said unto his disciples, The day will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. Now, this is a very important verse here. Because what Jesus is saying is that um, your, your, uh, uh, your um, uh, situation that you have right now, with me standing here, talking with you, freely giving you a... Uh, 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 my insight on what you should do as a disciple and as an apostle and my descriptions and answering your questions y'all don't realize how valuable this is but the day is going to come when you're going to be like I, I wish I could have been back there I would have asked them more because they, they don't get it now they think nothing really horrible is going to happen and they're not really truly appreciating the freedom that they have with Jesus in their midst now, let me tell you that that's very similar to what we got now, especially here in America. We don't realize how, I mean, it's the fact that we're sitting here in a cafe, you know, just going through the word of God, just as, you know, as freely as we desire. This is not going to always be. It has not always been. There were times shortly after Jesus' departure and when the disciples uh, had begun to start the early church, they were persecuted. And you can read uh, Fox's book, Book of Martyrs, and you can read some of the, uh, the writings of some of the ancient uh, historians from the, uh, the first and second and third century. And they will give you descriptions of how Christians were just, they were just, we, we were just thrown to the lions and burned at the stake. And, you know, up until the time that Constantine became emperor, when he more or less embraced it and infiltrated it, and diluted it a little bit, you know, um, and, and, and then a whole nother spin was taken, and we'll talk about that on another point. But we're at a point now where the, the freedom of the word of God here in America is something we shouldn't take lightly. There's going to come a day when people are going to say, I wish we could just go to a, to a cafe and just gather together, you know, you know a, a dozen folks or so and just start talking about the word freely. It's not going to always be that way. So since you can do it, take advantage of it. Consider it time well spent. All right? Because it's not going to always be. And then the, um, the ability to pass that on. Because see, uh, I'm not going to always be here. You're not going to always be here. You're not going to always be here. But if I don't give to my kids at least a foundation... This is what you got to try to look for. These are the things you got to try to keep in mind, you know, as you become a man and as you become a young lady. 
you got to kind of keep some 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 footholds to hold on to because people are going to come and deceive many look out for this look out for that all right because there's going to be a lot of deceptions well i'm getting ahead of myself but let me let's, let's, let let me let the word catch up to what i'm trying to say here all right um verse 23 and they shall say unto you see here or see there go not after them nor follow them all right Wh who is he talking about here because you're going to want to have those days like you have now where you can talk freely right that's what he said in verse 22 in verse 23 he says and they shall say well since you want to have those days see here in other words you know here's a place where you can go or uh or see there well here's another place you can go but he says go not after them nor what follow them why because these are going to be deceitful teachers so he's saying that there's going to be days when it will be talked about but the talking is not going to be truth you're going to desire can we just find a church a place of worship where people just talk about truth they're not talking about money. They're not talking about power. They're not talking about politics. They're not talk Can we just find, Jesus says, be careful. Now, Jesus is passing down this information to his disciples because they're going to be the ones that are going to enter into this next stage of developing the first church and the early church. <coughs> Excuse me. That same scenario is what we as older and I say, I say older, but I know what I mean. You know, this generation of folks, we have to pass it down to the next generation. If we don't, they will be deceived. So therefore, we have to say, you know, son, listen, you know what? Always look for this and always look for that. Daughter, let me tell you, you're going to find a lot of people, they're going to be talking about this and talking about that. Don't go after that kind of stuff. Don't follow this kind of stuff. Turn on the TV today. What do you see on the TV? There's some very popular people on TV. And why are they popular? But but now if nobody was following them, would they be popular? No. They wouldn't be. So they are popular, why? Because there's a whole lot of people that are following them. A whole lot of people because they are not grounded. And so therefore, the Lord said, don't go after this kind of stuff. Don't go after that kind of stuff. But guess what the majority of people are doing? They're going after it. And then therefore, you got all these people that, you know, got all this different stuff. And you can, I mean, it's, I mean, and sometimes I just think if you just pray and ask God, God, give me the wisdom to be able to discern between truth and error. You can look at some of these people on these TV, you know, and I, I, every now and then I'll flip the TV on and I'll run across something and I'll just sit there for five minutes, just listen to it and try to, because, you know, you, you'll hear a good five minutes and be like, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's pretty good. That's all right. That's okay. Then all of a sudden, here come the bombshell. Now, if you just believe by just sending me that $400, now it's got to be for If you don't send $400, you ain't got faith. And I go, okay, there we go. They, they, they also teach if you just pray and accept Christ, you're saved. Hmm. That's not true. You have to be an overcomer, and it's in the scriptures that teaches you. you you're judged according to your deeds and according to your, the fruit of your faith. Hmm. So you have to develop your faith, and you're going to bear fruit. You can't just pray, oh, God, I accept you. Thank you for saving me. And then go back to no. check on your life and do all this. And there has to be a transformation. Right. Uh, and a transformation is something that, that has to happen. If you're not transformed, the Bible says, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be you what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so your mind does have to be changed. Um, and even with that, that don't mean that you're going to be, you're going to be uh, uh, perfect, but you certainly should not be devilish. And you shouldn't be wicked. And there should be some transformation that takes place. But the actual... Sal salvation is without works. Mm -hmm. Salvation is is being saved by by faith in Christ through uh, through His grace and mercy alone. But after being saved, 
you should have fruits of salvation. Remember, uh, the people that act like they're saved through words but have no deeds, the Bible says, will be plucked up. The Bible also talks about those being cut off. So he's not going to no nobody's going to get over. And I don't know how, how often I have to just say that phrase because people think they're going to outslick God. You know, there's, there's no hookup. You know, there's no, yo, God, you know, it's, yo, there's none of that. You, you cannot get over on God. If you got problems and if you are, 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 are trying to live, uh, live for the Lord and you got issues, you better just tell the Lord, Lord, I'm trying to live for you and I got issues. Do not be a hypocrite because the Pharisees, like what Brother Gabe was talking about, those Pharisees, they talked about God. But what did Jesus say their father was? He said, your father is the devil. But now they go into all the synagogues. They're doing all the studying in the scripture. Now you spending all this time and then turn around and the Lord tells you, did your father is the devil? I, be, I tell you, I, I, I don't want that. So uh, look at verse 24. He says, for as the lightning uh, that lighteth uh, uh, out of one part unto uh, of heaven and it shineth unto the other part unto, under heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. So it's going to be something that is extremely obvious. All right? Um, when you in the pitch black uh, dead of night and you see lightning, you, need, you know, you, you don't have to, 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 to wonder, you know, oh, what was that? You, oh, I know what that was. That was lightning. It was obvious. Anyone that has proper vision could see it. And it's the same thing what Jesus is saying. If you have proper spiritual vision, you're going to see his kingdom. You're going to see truth. But you do need to have what? Proper vision. You've got to be able to see truth from error. And if you can see truth from error, don't worry about it. You won't be deceived. You won't be running all off to all this crazy stuff. You're going to find truth and you'll gravitate to the right thing. All right? Um, so he's saying, you know, you don't, you don't have to worry about being deceived. It's going to be very obvious to you. Look at verse 25. But first uh, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Now, he's going back to his time. He's saying that who's going to suffer many things? He is. And, and he is going to be rejected by who? His current generation. He's talking about what? His, his, uh, his uh, death, his crucifixion and death. He's about to suffer. Verse 26. And as it was in the day of Noe, now he's going back. Now look at this. So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. So he's saying at the time when I am uh, uh, preparing to I let the lightning strike so that the kingdom of God will be seen to everybody. All right. One of the events that I personally believe that will be that lightning strike that will be obvious to everybody is the rapture. I think the rapture is a lightning strike. Um, when it happens, there will be no question as to what will happen. As to, people are going to be like, well, what happened? They're going to know it was God. But they still won't acknowledge that it's God. Now, uh, and, I, and the reason why I say I personally believe, because it ain't happened yet. God can do a whole lot of other things. I don't put God in the box and say, well, this has to happen. It's going to happen this way. I'm telling you, follow the scripture. Obey God. Know who he is. And when his lightning strikes happen, you will know it. You will absolutely know it. And I do believe that the Bible does talk about the rapture. And I do believe that that will be one of his lightning strikes. It will be something that everybody on this planet will know about. All right? To some degree or another. Um, but then he goes in and he says, but now in the, like uh, it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day that the Son of Man come. Look at verse 27. They did eat, they did drink, they married, wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came. And this is why I think it's probably, you know, the rapture could be uh, uh, one of these things because this speaks about a time when those that were called of God to a point of safety were separated from those that were left. 
Yes, sir. The, the pre-trib, I don't, I don't agree with because it's kind of setting everybody up for a great deception. It says many will be offended and they'll fall away because mm -hmm. they're going to be like, well, where's your Savior? I thought you were going to get raptured out. What happened? Right. Because we're all going to be suffering. Just like the people in Noah's Ark were suffering while they were being delivered, while the Ark was being tossed about, they cried out. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We're going to be getting judged also, going through trials and tribulation. And a lot of people are going to get offended and fall away. Right. There's no pre-trib rapture. It's a resurrection. It's not a rapture. Right. Now, I'll, I'll give you... Yes, sir. We also see another key thing in here that I think we tend to overlook, too. Uh, you see that God is still honoring marriage. Mm -hmm. He's still mentioning the word marriage. Mm -hmm. Marriage is still, still honorable. But the bed is still undefiled. Mm -hmm. If you're not married, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Just letting you know, you know that these things are going on. Now they're talking about, you know, they're trying to push marriage out the window. They're trying to push God's word out, but he keeps letting us know that certain things are still in existence. Always will be. Exactly. And, um... You know, my take on a lot of the, uh, the, the aspects, I, I've, I've studied all of those uh, pre-trip, post-trip, uh, um, um, mid-trip, and I, I, I lean towards the fact that the rapture will probably happen, in my opinion, before the tribulation. But I'm not to a, a point where I think the scripture, because you can find scripture to defend both. Uh, so for... On a situation like that, I just have to say this, be ready for either or. Because the reality, I can't tell you it's definitely going to happen one way or another. I can just tell you I feel it's going to happen one way. Now, the thing you have to keep in mind, the reason why I tell you this, to be flexible to, and watch for what God does, not for what I believe or what I say is going to happen. Because this is the problem that the Pharisees had. The Pharisees were so stuck on it's going to happen the way I perceive scripture to happen. That when Jesus came as the suffering servant and they were looking for the what? Conquering Messiah. That they couldn't see it. They just couldn't see it. They would not allow themselves to bend and to say, oh, well maybe even though we love the scripture, we kind of interpreted it a certain way. But the reality was, number one, they didn't truly love the scripture. They manipulated the scripture. And they would not allow themselves to be flexible. Even the disciples were caught up in that aspect. And that's why they kept trying to get Jesus to stop talking about him dying. Because they were saying, we really believe you're the Messiah. But if you're really the Messiah, you can't talk about dying. Because <laughs> the Messiah doesn't die. <laughs> and so they couldn't get it. And so I use that as instruction for me. Because in, in our day, our discussion is when is the rapture going to happen and we you know we got the pharisees the sadducees the scribes today we got post-trib mid-trib pre-trib all right and you know what I, I i have a view that i have and i stand to i stand to it and i can defend it and i'll tell you why i believe it but i will also say this that when jesus comes and when it when if the Antichrist is revealed and I have not been raptured, then I'd be like, okay, all right. It's obviously at least mid-trib or it's post-trib. If I get raptured, I'm going to be like, who cares? I'm raptured. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it was pre-trib and nobody, you know. So the realities of it is stick with the word. When the lightning strikes happen, if you truly love the Lord, you will not be deceived. And that's the key. That's all I can tell you. I can't, I, I can't be dogmatic on any particular aspect. Certain things I can be dogmatic on. I can be dogmatic on Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. Yeah. I, and I'm not been in there. I'm not been in there regardless. I don't care what you say. I don't care how you talk about how nice Muslims are and how nice uh, you know, everybody else is. I'm not bending on that. That is a stick in the ground, never ever move. Jesus is, not only is he the way to heaven, he's the only way to heaven. All right? I'm not bending on that. And you need to come to God by faith and trusting him and exchange your, your, your corruptness for his righteousness. 
there's an imputation that has to happen. That's how you get saved. You have to be regenerated. You got to be what? Born again. I'm not moving on that. Well, you don't have, you just have to love everybody. No, loving everybody is not going to get you to heaven. You got to know Jesus as your Savior. Now, and there's a, there's a few more things that we could go on and on. But when it comes to things of eschatology, I've learned by watching what happened during Jesus' day. Don't get yourself stuck in a corner. You know, be able to look at things with a, uh, a view of, all right, I have a personal view as to how I think it's going to happen. But that don't mean it has to happen exactly like I see it. Now, I'm going to lay out my view, but then I also do what? I listen to other people's view. Because their view is just as valid as mine on eschatology. And what's eschatology? The, uh, the, the uh, study of the end times. Eschatology is the study of the end times on how the world will, uh, will be uh, overtaken by God's kingdom. How that process happens. How the Antichrist is revealed. When the millennium will happen. When the rapture will happen. When the tribulation will happen. When the great tribulation will happen. All those things are go all of those things are going to happen. How they happen and in what orders and how they all mingle together and, and all that, uh, we will not be confused when it happens. All right? And that's the beauty of scripture. Remember, scripture's alive. And I gave the example I think on last week on how we we know that there was even one portion of scripture where uh, it may have been confusing to people early on centuries ago, but it's not confusing to us now because we're living in a day where that scripture makes a whole lot of sense. And the scripture where it says that no one will be able to buy or sell unless they had the what? Mark of the beast. Now back in George Washington's day or in Napoleon's day or you know, they'd be like, well, how can somebody that's in Iowa know what somebody in New York is buying or selling? Because they didn't have computers and electronic communications and all that. Well, now, the people that studied the Bible in that day looked at that scripture and probably was wondering what kind of telekinesis or what kind of things going to happen that people will, that the Antichrist would know whenever somebody bought a bag of potato chips, you know, or bought a, you know, or bought a horse, or bought a carriage, all right? Today in our world, that scripture is a no-brainer. It's simple. We know how that can happen, you know? When I go out here and pay the, pay the bill for our tab at the Muddy Cup, anybody that got access to electronic will be able to, to tell, well, he paid another bill at the Muddy Cup. Hmm, wonder what they're doing down there. You know, if they wanted to, they could. They got records. They got, when you go to Walmart, they know not only what you bought, what you like, they know how much you eat, they know how much milk you use, they even know if you like milk. They know if you like, if you are allergic to certain things. They only buy stuff that, that has these products in it, not these products in it. Man, they got information on you. And today, those kind of scriptures as to how the forces of the Antichrist can know so much about you, it's simplistic. And it didn't take no divine super rev uh, revelation to understand it. You just had to do what? Live in our time. So, a lot of the things that are going to be uh, showcased that are prophesied in Revelation and in Daniel, I do believe that when they do happen in the days of the people that are, will be on the planet, could be tomorrow, could be 100 years from now, it's going to be a lot of very, oh, oh, I, I see it. Clear observation as to how things actually panned out. Um, there also will be some confusion and some deception, and that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying the deception is going to happen because people are going to be so caught up and just, you know, well, there's no big deal. They've been saying this. It's been like this before. And he gives the example of Noah, and he also gives the example of who? Lot. And then, uh, and let me, let me uh, finish this up. Uh, and um, verse 28, he says, And likewise also it shall be in the days of Lot. They did eat, they did drink, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went into uh, went out of Sodom, uh, it rained what? Fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed some of them? Them all. Them all. all right? Even, 
Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is what? Revealed. Notice it didn't say when the Son of Man comes. It says when the Son of Man is what? Revealed. In other words, it's almost like, you know, exactly. When he's taken, the Lord said, Lord, I'm always what? With you. All right, 31. In that day, he shall, that there shall uh, uh, be upon the housetop, uh, and, and um, let me read that again. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down and take it away. In other words, he's saying, don't get concerned about earthly things when you start seeing the signs of the time. Well, what sign? Don't worry about it. When you see it, it's going to be like what? Lightning. It's going to be obvious. Well, well, well Wayne, what is it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to be. But when you see it, you will, you will know it. All right? It will be like the elephant in the room type of thing. You're not going to be able to miss it. All right? He says, don't come down. And those that be in the field, let him likewise not return back. Look at verse 32. It says, remember what? Lot's wife. All right? Now we know what happened to Lot's wife. When she got uh, uh, driven out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and she heard the screaming and all the yelling, she turned and looked back. And the Bible says, and she turned into a pillar of salt. And so um, you can't just leave something because you know it's right to leave, but then not really want to leave. She left physically, but her being was still in Lot, still in Sodom and Gomorrah. And therefore, she re even though she physically got out, she really didn't leave. And so that's why I said you're not going to get over. Some people are going to just say, like what Brother Gabe, I believe Jesus is my Savior. That's like, I just got out of, Lot. I just got out of Sodom. No, you didn't. Because your actions and your deeds show that you, didn't, you never really left. And therefore, you're, you're, you're going to get trapped right where you are. All right. Uh, let's let's uh, finish these last verses here. Uh, Y'all just give me two more minutes here and we'll be done. It says, uh, uh, Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall what? Lose. lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall what? Preserve it. In other words, don't always worry about the flesh. Be more concerned about the what? Spiritual person. All right. I tell you, uh, that in that night there shall be two people sleeping in the bed. One shall be taken and the other shall be what? Left. All right. What does that refer to? Well, it certainly could refer to the rapture, but it could refer to other things too. All right. But I think it's a very good uh, indication of a rapture. Uh, two women shall be grinding at the, at the mill together. One shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken, the other shall be left. And look at verse 37. And they answered, and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Now look, look, they're like, Lord, <laughs> you're saying all this stuff, where, what, how will all this stuff happen? And, and look at what his answer is. Look at what Jesus, he's like, Jesus is giving them all this information about the, the, the revealing of the kingdom of God, about the times of the end, about these signs, about this lightning, about... Or, and they want to know when and where and how. And look what his answer is. Wherever the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. You see that answer? Now, we're, now take a look at that. Now, the, 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 you, you could call this word eagles or you could call this birds of prey or vultures or whatever. But take a, take, if you're in the desert somewhere and all of a sudden you see uh, birds of prey circling. What do you kind of think, even though you may not see it, what do you think is there? Something dead. Something dead. Exactly. So he's saying, just as you can determine something that you can't see by something that you what? Can see. That's how you're going to know. So did he give them a direct answer? When they say where, he said, don't worry about it. You that trust in me, you won't be deceived. Just like you can, you can tell there's a dead body miles away because you see the birds circling, and you know, oh, must be a dead body up there. That's the same way you're going to know when I'm here. You will see the signs. You will be able to see it. And so, therefore, for us, now, be honest. Let me say this, and then we're going to close. 
Wouldn't you like the Lord to say, well, in 2014, on you know, December the 12th, this is when it's going to happen. We get on our calendars, we block our calendars, boy, right? It'd be simple. But he didn't do that, did he? He told us we got to do what? Watch. We got to be watchful. And which really is the best thing. So that means that you do got to pay attention. You got to stay in the Word, stay in prayer, stay connected to the Lord, communicate with people. And what's nice is to share, like how we're doing now, we share and communicate so we don't get locked into one thing, you know? Like, like Brother Gabe talked about how he has a view on certain things, I have a view on certain things, and that's good. We don't all, because if we all think the same all the time, that's how cults get started, because nobody is, has room for variation. And when somebody thinks different than you, you, know, you get out. No, I, I, variety is nice. We're not gonna have a variety on who's the, who's the savior. Everybody that believes that Jesus is the, is the savior, that's fine, we, we all need to come around. But when it comes to how this is, you know, stuff that's, you know, that's good because look at how Jesus developed his following. He didn't just get uh, fishermen. He got fishermen. He got zealots. He got a doctor. Right? He got a tax collector. He got all these people with all different kinds of points of views and put them together and then start talking to them and showing them stuff. And they all had different points of view. And, and John and James, when they saw people that didn't think like they thought, because they were zealots, they were like, Jesus, should we call fire from heaven to destroy them? And Jesus said, bro, you don't even know what kind of spirit you are saying something like that. No. Though they're not against us, they're, all, they're for us. Let's leave them alone. All right? And then you got Peter, who just, he's in, you know, Peter knows everything. Lord, though, Lord, though all of them may deceive you, may, may leave you, I'll never leave you. And Jesus is like, yeah, but before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. Variety of people. Matthew, a tax collector. Well, that's why Matthew wasn't the treasurer. <laughs> They didn't, he was the one with the most money experience. If you notice that, right? But they didn't make Matthew the, the what? The treasurer. They, met, they let Judas be the treasurer. Judas had the most executive experience. Who also was the what? The one that betrayed him. So you have all this, and it's a lot of, but it's, it's, it's good uh, to have that, that communication and to know that if you just trust in Jesus, Follow his word and be led by the spirit. You will not be deceived. That's the ingredients. Tell me how I can, I can't give you precise things. I can just give you this. Know Jesus, get in his word, follow his spirit. I can't give you no more than that. Everything else is going to be an elaboration on one of those three things that I just said. All right. So with that, we're going to stop. We'll pick up on chapter 18 on next week. Let's, let's bow our heads. Father God, once again, we come to you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We come thanking you, O God, for this hour. And Lord, we just praise you, O God, for your word and for your anointing and for your spirit. We ask, O God, that you continually speak to us and through us, O God. Help us, O God, to be insightful, O God, and help us, O God, to be obedient to your word and, O God, to be obedient to your spirit. Now, Lord, as we leave this time of study, but we never leave your presence, we ask that you would be with us and watch over us and keep us and allow us to come back at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.